I must say, Neve, after having chatted on online forums before, it's really lovely to be able to chat in person about your experience as a multiple myeloma patient and my experience probably as a, a multiple myeloma researcher. So it's, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's super to be here today. Um, so maybe could you get started and tell us um, what is multiple myeloma? So multiple myeloma is, is a blood cancer and that makes it tricky from several perspectives. Lots of people, I suppose, are familiar with you know, solid tumours, things like breast cancer and certainly my own background in working in breast cancer is maybe a little bit uh, more familiar to me. But lots of people then have that experience where there's a solid tumour and then a surgeon can remove it and then it, uh, you know, things get better, I guess. But with any of the blood cancers, uh, like multiple myeloma, and multiple myeloma is the second most common blood cancer. Um, there's about, I think, 350 or 400 new cases diagnosed in Ireland every year. And the tricky thing about it, obviously, is that you can't take out somebody's blood. So it's circulating around the body. And what happens is that a part of the blood, uh, some of the cells of the blood, blood, these tiny living units that make up our blood, uh, start to malfunction. So, you know, we have the red blood cells, which carry oxygen around the body. And then we have the platelets, which help us, our bodies, um, form a clot and stop excess of bleeding. And then we have these, these great cells called white blood cells, which help us fight infection. And in multiple myeloma specifically, uh, there is an abnormality in a type of white blood cell called uh, a plasma cell, which is a cell that usually makes antibodies. And we'll all have heard of antibodies from people talking about, you know, antibodies, uh, you know, protecting us from COVID, etc. But in multiple myeloma patients, the plasma cells go a little bit crazy and they start producing abnormal products. So they don't produce the proper antibodies anymore. They're making lots and lots of other substances which basically clog up the bone marrow where they're made. And that affects the ability of the body to make the other kinds of blood cells it needs. So one analogy that, that we've used before, which is a nice one, is that the bone marrow and the blood is a bit like a garden where you've got lots of different types of flowers and each flower corresponds to a different cell type. So if the cell type, which, you know, which is the plasma cells, starts to crowd out all the other flowers in the garden, then it simply gets overgrown and the red blood cells can't work properly, the platelets don't work properly, and then people have all sorts of symptoms. But that's where I'd love to hear your perspective because obviously you as a patient have experienced those kind of symptoms and I'd love to know how it was for you. When did you first figure out that something was wrong? Well, interestingly for me, I actually was diagnosed entirely by accident um, thankfully, I had no symptoms whatsoever, and it, my diagnosis was picked up in a just in a routine blood test. So I was very lucky um, in that respect. It meant it was picked up very early and before I had any symptoms. Um, I mean, I guess the the common symptoms that people present with are um, bone pain, um, anemia, uh, which causes a lot of fatigue, and um, uh, unusual calcium levels would be the other thing that that commonly presents or um, kidney problems. Um, so thankfully for me, I, I didn't have any of those symptoms, um, but they are the most common ones. And I think that it's one of the difficulties with myeloma is that um, it, it's frequently not diagnosed for quite a long time because the symptoms are quite vague and um, and also can be quite unspecific and um, often people only may appear with one of those and not all of them. So um, it can be quite tricky to diagnose. Um, and, and I, you know, it, it is one of the one of the key things is the earlier it's diagnosed, like with most types of cancer, the earlier it's diagnosed, the, the more straightforward it is to treat. The, and how about infections, Neve? Because I understand that if the white blood cells aren't working properly, that they're also not defending us properly against, you know, various things, whether it's bacterial infections, viral infections. Did you have none of those symptoms of recurrent infections at your estate? No, I had nothing, thankfully. I mean, I was I was really very lucky that it was picked up um, so early. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's certainly a persistent issue for many people. Uh, it's also an issue with the ongoing treatment because... And it's where the, the, the difficulty in treatment comes because you have to 
be on a permanent level of chemotherapy, which has to lower those white blood cells, but also maintain them at a level that's high enough to to protect you. Um, and so that's definitely part of the balancing act of the treatment um, part of, of myeloma. Um, uh, and I guess one of the one of the initial um, one of the initial parts of the treatment plan for most patients is having a stem cell transplant, which um, which is the most common one. Most most myeloma patients will have their own cells um, transplanted, and that's a that's a an unusual scenario. In, in many of the other cancers, you will have stem cells that are donated by somebody else. Whereas one of the benefits of myeloma is that you can have your own cells um, for the most part. And that uh, makes it a slight, a somewhat easier process. Right. right. But not terribly easy either. No, I mean, it's it's not it's, it's not yeah. great, but it's definitely a little bit easier. <laughs> and how was it for you, Niamh, when Because obviously before they harvest your stem cells, they have to give you lots of chemotherapy to try and control the cancer before they can get some healthy stem cells and... I imagine that must be very arduous. Uh, I, in general, you're in once a week for um, a period of months before you you um, get your stem cell harvest. And then um, before the harvest is done, you, you'll you get um, quite a, a high dose of chemotherapy. Um, and then that's followed by some injections that stimulate your body to producing extra stem cells. The actual harvest process itself, for most people, it's only it only takes about a day, um, and it's you know, and and then they they will freeze those cells and they're stored until when you need them. Um, I think one of the one of the other important things to point out is that lots of people know about about um, donating blood, but not that many people know that you can also donate your stem cells. So how how do you do that? Well, you you do that by um, joining the the stem cell register, and you can send in a swab. That's just it's a saliva swab, so you get a cotton bud on the inside of your mouth. It's a very simple process, and then you send that in, and they will then keep your your um, sample on file. And then, if a suitable match comes up, you can go in and donate your your cells. And for a healthy person, that's a very straightforward process. They um, it doesn't take very long, and it's it's not. It's it's generally not a, not a difficult thing, but you can you can quite literally save somebody's life with that, and presumably that applies to all the other blood cancers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean that that would be a, if if there's something that people would like to do in order to help these types of cancers, donating blood and donating stem cells, or at least joining the stem cell register is is a really important thing that anybody can do. It's funny because I always hear about blood donor campaigns. I've never heard about a stem cell donor campaign, but it's definitely something that, you know, that it'd be great to be more aware of. Yeah, no, and it's a really amazing thing to do. And as I say, a very simple, very quick um, process for the donor, yeah. but but it has a real impact for the for the recipient. Yeah. So thankfully, I was able to use my, my own cells, um, but um, lots of people aren't. And so that it's a, it's a really big thing that you can do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so interesting to hear because I think as as a researcher and you know pharmacologist in my own case, I, I'm used to hearing about drugs and about you know we, we try to design drugs, we do all sorts of things to understand how people can be treated, but then obviously there are these physical things like giving somebody cells to replace the, their own cells that have been damaged by chemotherapy, which is I suppose always the the bad thing about chemotherapy you know, it's killing off the healthy cells as well as it's killing off the cancer cells. So it's it's a bit of catch-22, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, in, in the case of having a stem cell transplant, I think maybe the transplant piece is, is, a, is a, a bit of a misnomer because, as you say, the, the idea behind a stem cell transplant is to enable you to get a very high dose of chemo and then without the, the stem cells being reinfused back in, you would um, you would then have to stay in isolation in hospital for a very long period until your body was able to regrow its bone marrow again. But by um, reinfusing these cells that have been frozen, you can um, it allows you to recover much faster and much more safely, and you can you can um, leave hospital much quicker. Yeah. So um, it, it's it's it is a it's it's a yeah it's a hard process, but it is amazing. Yeah. 
and it is very much life saving. It's still, it's still the the main avenue of treatment for myeloma. Certainly in the first line, if if you're eligible for it. Yeah, that's amazing. And then I suppose the the thing I find really interesting about multiple myeloma treatment as well is because, on the one hand, you're trying to kill the cancer cells and keep the patient healthy, but then on the other hand. There's all sorts of conditions that arise, like you mentioned, anemia, because the red blood cells are being crowded out of the bone marrow. They're not working properly. There's things like bruising, bleeding, you know, caused by clotting problems because the platelets aren't functioning. There's kidney trouble. There's all sorts of things. So it's quite complex, isn't it, that people have to be managed not just to kill the cancer cells, but also to support their quality of life. Yeah. And, and then the bone bone issues, of course, are, are big ones. So people can get fractures and yeah. It it can be very complex to manage. And I think that's one of it's certainly one of the difficulties in terms of the the hospital care team. And so people tend to have quite a large team of experts helping them as opposed to just one person. Um I mean a very common way that people are diagnosed is through fractures or broken bones that happen sort of seemingly due to nothing, you know, maybe they pick up a heavy bag or, you know, opening a tricky lock on a door and things like that can or um, or can give them fractures in their arms, most commonly in their back. Um, and so, yeah, it can, it, it can take quite a lot of quite a lot of care and attention, particularly up front in the early in the early stages of diagnosis. Um, but I mean, the, you know, once once Di- the diagnosis has happened. There are quite a there's quite a lot of treatment pathways now, and there's a huge number of new um, of new types of treatment and new medicines that are coming online all the time. And that's where people like you come in, who are designing the next generation of these type of of treatments. Well, I suppose that that's the really encouraging thing about this that there's been so many new treatments that have come online for all of the cancers, but. Multiple myeloma is one of the rare ones. People just don't tend to know about it. And they know even less then about the treatments, I suppose, until it it happens to them. But yeah, it is. It's really encouraging that, you know, in the past, everything to do with cancer treatment was such a sledgehammer approach. Like you're, you know, you're bashing the cancer cells with various drugs, which are killing everything. And, you know, that's why obviously people's hair is falling out, why their blood cells are are, uh, dissipating, etc. Because you know, in order to kill those cancer cells, it's it's so destructive to all healthy cells that are rapidly dividing, you know, in the body as well. So it's lovely now to see these newer kinds of therapies, things like targeted therapies. That's that's a bit of a catch-all term for everything, where, you know, instead of just trying to kill a cancer cell, what you try to do is to target a specific way in which that cancer cell is signaling. And with all of the advances that we have nowadays with, you know, um, genetic sequencing, so being able to understand more about the, the genetic makeup of a patient, that it's much easier then to be able to select particular therapies that could work for somebody's cancer. Because obviously not everybody's cancer is the same. Multiple myeloma is no different. So between you know targeted therapies in conjunction with steroids, these are really old medications, of course, and steroids are used for lots of things. But in multiple myeloma, um, you know, they're, they're still used to reduce the inflammation, reduce the swelling associated with the, the, the immune response or, or lack thereof sometimes. So they're really useful. But also these immunomodulatory drugs, uh, things like lenalidomide, which is probably something that, that you've had in the past. And, um, and then all, also this new class of drug, well, relatively new class of drug called a proteasome inhibitor, which is a really interesting concept because, you know, proteasomes are just like little shredders that live inside our cells and they chop up all the bits of the, the cells that we don't need. So the proteins that are that are not needed anymore. Um, and, and I don't mean the protein that you take in through your food. I mean the protein that makes up the fundamental parts of, you know, the, the units of, of our body, which, uh, which live all of the cells in our bodies. But these proteasome inhibitors, to, to somebody like myself who works on drugs, are particularly interesting because by inhibiting this shredder, this, the, the proteasome that lives inside the cells, the, the proteins that should be getting shredded don't get shredded. So they build up and build up and build up. And then the body recognizes that there's a problem with the cell and then so it kills it naturally. So if you like, it's, it's one way of drugs turning on 
a response that you want in the body. You want the body to be able to clear those damaged cells in the same way that people nowadays are getting really interested in immunotherapies for, for all sorts of cancers, uh, multiple myeloma included, uh, with, with the theory being that instead of, again, the sledgehammer approach of giving lots and lots of anti-cancer drugs, that you try and activate the person's own immune system to turn on the tumours and to, to basically fight them in the way that they should. Because there's, there's lots of evidence out there to show that most of us probably have very early tumours or pre-tumours uh, at many stages of our life that never develop into cancer because the immune system keeps them in check. And so the, the newer immune modulatory drugs and the, the immunotherapies I find really exciting to, um, to be able to activate the immune system to kill off what, what you want to kill from within. Um, so that's, I suppose, one of the angles that, that we all think of when we're designing drugs. But, you know, you and I have interacted before on, on a project that myself and Professor Siobhan Glavi, the consultant hematologist, um, who I know you've interacted with a lot, um, we've been working on trying to design some new drugs that attack different targets in, in multiple myeloma cells. And some of this work sort of developed very organically because my group had been working on a particular target which is known to go way up in breast cancer patients and also in brain cancer patients. And it's known to drive kind of behaviours that a tumour cell would find useful when it's trying to keep itself alive and to survive and to grow. And so myself and Professor Glavi had a conversation over coffee a couple of years ago um, because it had just been discovered at that time that this particular target also goes up in multiple myeloma patients and happens to be associated with a very aggressive type of multiple myeloma. So we thought, you know, wouldn't it be really interesting to, to work together and to try and design drugs to target that and um, hopefully, you know, bring it through a pipeline where you, you always start off very small, you know, in, in any kind of basic cancer biology, you've got to start on cells, you know, the, the fundamental units of life. You never design a drug and bring it straight to a patient because it would have to be verified, um, you know, that it, that it works and we know how it works in a very simple cellular system first. And then typically those types of um, approaches end up, you know, maybe going up the pipeline, maybe into animal models. And eventually the goal would be that some of these neurotherapies could end up in clinical trials, which is sort of the, the way in which therapies are tested before they go into patients. And it's, it's very rigorous and a, a very safe system where no patient gets something which might compromise their care. If a new drug is being tested, it's still, I suppose, that the safeguard is that you are still going to get the best standard of care, but you may get an extra drug which is being tested with the view to it hopefully improving the responsiveness of a patient to, to a therapy or, or maybe treating uh, multiple myeloma, which has relapsed, because I know you've probably had experiences with that as well, where you have your first therapy and that's great. Um, the multiple myeloma kind of stays in remission. And if you look for these abnormal markers in the blood, they go away for a while, but sometimes they come back. And I suppose research really is our way of trying to understand new ways to be able to develop better drugs such that when somebody's disease does relapse, that there are other treatment options besides just the simple ones that are available, which a patient may have stopped responding to. And how do patients in Ireland, um, if they would like to, how do they get involved in these clinical trials? That's a great question, because I suppose for anybody who's, you know, a patient with multiple myeloma or maybe the pre-malignant stages or the, the, the you know, the, the pre-malignant stages of multiple myeloma, the early stages of multiple myeloma, they would probably talk to their doctors. So, you know, their haematologists like Professor Glavi in Beaumont and so many great haematologists all over the country. And the haematologist might then say, oh, you know, you've got quite an aggressive form of disease. We can give you such and such therapies, but, you know, we might recommend that you enroll on a clinical trial, which has just become available, which we think could be good for your type of cancer. Mm -hmm. So probably the, the first point of contact might be through your clinical team, your consultant and maybe the haematology nurses or the, uh, the, the specialist doctors. Um, but also people can look into this by themselves by looking up Cancer Trials Ireland, which is the national authority for regulating cancer trials in, in the country. So 
they will have a list of what trials are open and which trials can um, recruit patients. And then, you know, in conjunction with your clinical team, it could then be decided that, okay, you meet the criteria that you could fit into this trial, but not that trial. Or equally, there may be no benefit to you registering for one particular trial. Maybe your your current therapy is 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 good up to the point you need it until maybe you relapse with your, your condition. So I suppose Cancer Trials Ireland and your clinical care team are the, the, the way to understand what's available. And certainly, you know, no drug gets approved without going through a clinical trial. So all of us who've ever had an antibiotic or a COVID vaccine or anything have benefited from clinical trials at some point. And um, it's, it's great if that information is available for the public to look at, I think. That's fabulous. Um, and there's a lot of research at the moment in Ireland um, into multiple myeloma and its treatments. Um, why do you think it's it's becoming a little bit more common now that, that people are looking into it? Because certainly it had previously been quite a quiet area of research. So it is a really interesting question as to why now there's so much extra activity on multiple myeloma research. And I think probably there's a lot more awareness among patients because they've got resources like the internet. So everybody might have heard of somebody with leukemia. You know, one of the le- leukemias or lymphomas, the two most common, well, one of the most, most common blood cancers. Um, and then multiple myeloma comes second. But then I think there's also a lot of, you know, highly trained clinician scientists who've uh, trained overseas in conjunction with here and then they've moved back and then they're interested in getting involved in clinical trials. Which, let's face it, you know, Ireland in the past may not have been the most attractive place to do clinical trials because, you know, we're a small island in some ways with a small patient population. But 350 to 400 new diagnoses of multiple myeloma per year is not insignificant. You know, it mounts up. And I think there's much greater interest now in clinicians enrolling their patients onto clinical trials. The patients are more aware too, which is, which is fantastic. And then the third part of this, in my view, is agencies, funding agencies like Breakthrough Cancer Research, who, you know, in conjunction with the Health Research Board, are funding the project that Professor Siobhan Glavie and myself are working on. And they, I suppose, specialize in trying to fund research into rare cancers, which is great because, you know, it, it brings the spotlight onto the fact that there are a lot of people living with that disease. And because these illnesses, some of them are incurable, you stand to be able to make a great change in people's lives if if new understanding about disease mechanisms comes out of the research and new understanding about potential new therapies or combinations of therapy comes into it as well. But then another part of that, that story is the fact that cancer is cancer. Whether it occurs in the blood or in the breast or in the lung, there are often similar things going on in the cancer cells. So, you know, you treat a cancer cell and it it tries to survive. I mean, just like just like humans have a, a humans, animals, we all have a survival instinct. It's the same kind of thing with with cancer cells. Even our smallest living units, they have survival instincts as well. And so, when you know cancer drugs are used to treat cells, some of them will survive, and they'll try really hard to survive. And it's those kinds of, I suppose, issues that will continue to drive research in multiple myeloma and the other cancers. How do you stop those few cells surviving? Because arguably all it takes is a few cells to be able to survive and then the tumor will recur. And um, I guess, you know, it's, it's great to see investment in research, which is very specific to a rare cancer, but which could have potential applications in so many other cancers as well. Yeah, and uh, particularly for myeloma, as you say, it is incurable. So I think the more, you know, the more treatments that people have available, you know, is that that equates into the the longer and the healthier lives they can have after after diagnosis. Yeah. So um, yeah, no. So I mean, it's it's a big impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, you know, the research community being so interconnected all over the world is is a super thing. So, you know, researchers will share models of the disease and you know, information on potential mechanisms of new drugs or the immunotherapies, you know, that's that's a great example of collaboration all over the world. So the the whole point, I think, now about research is to get as much information as possible from real patients. I mean, I, I'm a scientist. I'm as guilty as uh, as anybody, really, of of liking to work in little micro 
levels. So you're really comfortable working with your model organism or with your cells or whatever else. But ultimately, I mean, we've had experiences in the past where we've had fantastic um, activities of new drugs we've designed and you know, superb mechanisms of action of thing that, things that work in cells, but actually aren't all that relevant to patients. So I think one of the strengths about, you know, blood cancer is that because patients are constantly being sampled, you know, whether it's bone marrow uh, samples being taken or blood samples, just to monitor their routine care, um, if some of those samples can be used for research as well, you know, they wouldn't be taken if they weren't being taken for routine care. But if researchers can use them as well to assemble as much information as possible about different types of disease, then there's strength in this kind of population research. Certainly a lot more strength than in, um, in just focusing too much on, you know, a, a specific model or a specific mouse or various things that scientists have done in the past. So to be able to contextualize it with uh, results from patients all over the world, and particularly when you can repeatedly monitor the health of a patient through something like, you know, your routine appointments, it's, it's a little bit different, you might argue, for something like lung cancer or breast cancer when you get a lot of information when the patient has surgery and the tumour is taken out. And of course, you know, you can still look for residual signs of cancer cells or whatever in the blood, but it's not quite the same as a blood cancer, which is, uh, if you like, much more easily traceable than um, a cancer that comes from, you know, an organ where you've removed that tumour at some point, I suppose. It's, um, yeah. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about the booklet, the patient booklet that you have been working on lately? So this is an initiative that was um, spearheaded again by the, the funding provided to us by Breakthrough Cancer Research and the Health Research Board. And, you know, because patients should be central to everything that researchers do, and I think very much it's an evolving trend that there is a lot more interest in, uh, you know, ex exposing the public and patients to the type of research that we do. So what we've done with uh, some of the funding that we got from these agencies is to write a very simple booklet which summarizes things like what is multiple myeloma? You know, how do you get it? Uh, how do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? What hope is there for the future? What kind of research is going on? And so this was um, principally written by two students, two graduate students, supervised by myself and Siobhan Glavi, um, Neve McCauley and Isabella Drujd, in conjunction with patients like yourself, other patient advocates, clinicians, scientists. And so what we've endeavoured to do is to make a, a, a simplified resource which anybody could pick up in their doctor's surgery or in you know, the HIC primary healthcare centre and just read for information. See what is multiple myeloma, what's going on, you know, what are the symptoms, how would somebody know if they needed to be concerned? And also what kind of hope is there for the future in research? Because you know, many of us do believe that, that research is the key towards developing new drugs and better approaches to treat patients and to improve patients' quality of life. So we hope that uh, during Blood Cancer Awareness Month, which is this month and early into the next month, we'll have completed this booklet and we aim to circulate it all over the country. Um, it will also be available on the website of the Beaumont or CSI Cancer Centre so people can dip into it and have a little read and hopefully the language will be something that everybody will understand. And that's thanks to people like yourself who have helped us very much with how we should focus it and what's important for people to know. And also just raising awareness, really. Everybody has heard of advances in breast cancer and lung cancer. But again, very few people have heard about multiple myeloma and they probably mix it up with melanoma all the time, which is a completely different ball game. So hopefully our patient booklet and its, um, its kind of national circulation will help to demystify some of the things about multiple myeloma. Very good. I, I mean, certainly one of the things that, that fills me with hope um, regarding the kind of research that you and Professor Glavi do and, and other people around the country and in, indeed internationally is that there is this new focus now on um, looking at myeloma and not only looking at new types of treatments and new, new lines of treatments but also 
looking into the mechanisms of how the disease works and why it starts and all of those kind of things which you know currently aren't known and you know I think you know while it's not a good diagnosis like any cancer diagnosis is not a good one it certainly the future for this is is definitely looking more positive in terms of the number of new medicines that are coming online and that are even now currently available but then also the research that's um, in, in the pipeline all around all around this country and in other countries around the world.